Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan's corruption conviction has been suspended and the court has ordered his release on bail. But will this be enough to secure his freedom? Protests broke out across Libya following reports that the Tripoli-based government was attempting to normalize relations with Israel. However, many contradictory claims have since emerged. So, what really happened? New findings have emerged pointing to all the damage ultra-processed food does to the human body, adding to the already mounting evidence. Will this change our attitude towards food? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day and before you go any further, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The Islamabad High Court suspended charges of corruption against former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and overturned his three-year sentence. Khan stood accused of illegally selling the gifts he received from foreign governments during his tenure as Prime Minister. The cricketer-turned-politician, however, is still facing more than 100 cases. He was also barred from contesting elections by the country's election commission after his imprisonment. To tell us more about these developments, we are joined by Abdul. So thanks, Abdul, for joining us today. Can you start by giving us an update into the recent developments in Imran Khan's case and, you know, what does this mean for his freedom and his ability to contest elections? Well, uh, uh, Islamabad High Court passed an order earlier today which basically nullified the, in fact, not nullified, in, in fact, suspended the judgment given by the lower court according to which Imran Khan was convicted for three years for uh, in a, what is called the Tosha Khana case. Uh, which basically the gifts which he received, uh, his government received uh, from different foreign dignitaries, was uh, he was alleged of selling them illegally or acquiring them illegally without uh, declaring it, without paying enough compensation and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, as per the uh, recent, this, by the way, Islamabad High Court did not, uh, as I said before, nullify the judgment. It just has suspended it. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the case will ca go on. Uh, but the Islamabad High Court also ordered uh, immediate release of Imran Khan from the prison. However, within a few hours of this judgment was passed, uh, the a lower court has basically uh, sent him uh, on one, day, one day's judicial custody uh, in another case, which is called the Cypher right. case, the official documents missing of the official document case. So uh, this is about the case uh, as if now, as far as the ramification on his political future is concerned, again, that is not very clear. Uh, according to the legal experts from Pakistan, the suspension uh, in this uh, uh, in Tosha Khana case does not uh, mean that Imran Khan's conviction is, uh, 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 is withdrawn. And until that happens, because he's convicted for three years, uh, the election commission's ban on him contesting the election uh, will not be lifted. Again, this is just an opinion. It may vary if, if the court decides uh, to kind of uh, uh, suspend the uh, his uh, his disqualification. Also, it may it can do it uh, constitutionally. That is possible. But as if now, it is not very clear uh, whether the election commission of Pakistan will. Uh, 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 withdraw its suspension of Imran Khan. Uh, of course, the, his his popular uh, his, his party has welcomed the decision, and it seems that it it may energize the cadres all across the country, uh, and it, it can revive the hopes of Imran Khan coming and campaigning all across the country uh, because the elections are still far away. Uh, they are scheduled in November. And it is not certain whether election will happen in November or not. It might got delayed. Uh, even that uh, is not certain. So given the uh, larger uncertainty regarding the date of the election, regarding the constitutional uh, uh, on legal uh, nature of the suspension uh, of Imran Khan's conviction and uh, overall uh, political scenario in Pakistan, uh, it is too early to say anything about uh, uh, what will happen uh, in the coming days. I think uh, one should wait and, and uh, watch the developments carefully. 
Right. Of course, uh, every development related to Imran Khan has elicited strong uh, responses from the public in the past. What kind of response do you think uh, these developments will get from the larger public and from different sections of the political establishment? Well, as I said before, uh, uh, of course, PTI has been energized uh, with this particular uh, suspension. And it seems that uh, it will give credit to their allegations. If Imran Khan is con uh, Imran Khan is uh, not released on bail or arrested in some other case, because there are hundreds of cases filed against Imran Khan tomorrow, uh, that will give much more credit uh, to uh, PTI's claims that Imran Khan is being persecuted by the uh, uh, current establishment in the country. And that may kind of, of course, may help Imran Khan get much more popularity all across the country. He is already, as per the uh, current status, is already quite popular. His party has been winning the, all the by-elections, though it has been quite a time uh, uh, since the by-elections were last held. And there are also uh, claims that his popularity has gone down. It seems that, that this is still at a speculation level, level. And whatever evidences we have so far, it seems that Imran Khan's uh, and his party remains a strong contender. Um, during uh, After the verdict, immediately there were small celebrations held all across the country, particularly in uh, uh, Lahore and in Islamabad. Uh, and it seems uh, a large number of uh, 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 people on social media and in other uh, uh, places were showing uh, a positive response to uh, the the verdict and so that is again it is uh, too early to say anything on that front as well right abdul uh, thanks for this and we'll be back to you for an update on libya protests broke out in different cities of libya following reports that the tripoli based government of national unity was attempting to normalize relations with israel the turmoil was caused after it emerged that Libya's foreign minister, Najla al Mangush met with her Israeli counterpart, Eli Cohen, in a meeting in Rome. While earlier, Mangush attempted to dismiss the meeting as a chance encounter, newer reports have contradicted this claim. It has now emerged that the Libyan prime minister had knowledge of this meeting. Reports of the meeting have not gone down well with the people of Libya, which has historically been a strong ally of Palestine. We go back to Abdul for more details. So, Abdul, can you tell us what is happening in Libya? There are a lot of contradictory reports coming out about the meeting that happened uh, between the foreign minister of Libya and Israel. Yeah. So, uh, as per the latest report, it is now very clear that uh, the meeting between uh, Libya's foreign minister, uh, uh, Nazda, and uh, Israeli foreign minister, Eli Cohen, which happened last week, was official. Uh, uh, basically, it contradicts the statement issued by the Libyan foreign minister uh, a couple of days ago, in which it, it claimed that this was nothing official. They met informally during a party which was hosted by the Italian foreign minister. But the latest report claimed that uh, it was well, it was decided in advance uh, during the meeting between uh, 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 CIA uh, chief uh, and uh, Libya's prime minister, Abdul Hamid Dababa, the prime minister who is based in Tripoli, one, on, one of the governments in Libya. And uh, uh, this meeting was decided in advance. And there, has, uh, there are already processes going on under, of course, the U.S. pressure and or U.S. Uh, persuading, whatever you call it, uh, uh, to basically establish, because Libya has no prior uh, uh, relations with Israel, that in fact is a crime in Libya to have any kind of relationship with Israel. So there were, there were attempts under the uh, U.S. pressure to develop the relationship and normalize it, just like what other countries, some other countries in the Arab world has, have done, for example, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. So yeah, this was, it seems that this was official and uh, uh, the Baba government was uh, uh, on the way to normalize the relationship with Israel. And of course, there have been a, there's been a very strong response by the people to these uh, developments. Can you tell us about this and give us a uh, more historical background into the uh, policy of Libya towards Israel and Palestine? Well, uh, Libya is a country which was one of, considered one of the strongest and strongest uh, backers of the Palestinian cause uh, during Gaddafi's 
um, rule. Uh, it has basically hosted uh, PLO for a very long time. Uh, it was basically a country which was considered to be financially aiding uh, the Palestinian uh, liberation movement. But after Gaddafi's uh, uh, fall in 2011 under NATO invasion, um, since there has been no government in Libya, uh, and there were there was a civil war uh, going on in the country, and there were there are rival administrations in the country. It was not very clear what is their stand on Israel uh, so far. Uh, but the law which was passed in 1957 still remains in force, which basically criminalizes any relationship with Libya. So uh, given its history and given uh, the legal status, of course there is a there is a very strong popular sentiment in Libya, as, uh, which basically corresponds to what the law in Libya says, which basically no relationship with Israel uh, and uh, complete solidarity with Palestine. And it, it was reflected uh, uh, in the demonstrations which immediately broke out following the, uh, the news which came out uh, about meeting between uh, 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 Israeli foreign minister and uh, uh, Libya's foreign minister. Last week. So, uh, following the breakout of the news, large scale demonstrations were held all across the country. Across the con uh, across the, when we say across the country, of course, in the regions which are uh, held by two rival governments. And um, there was a strong demonstration in front of the Libyan Foreign Ministry office in Tripoli as well. Uh, across across the political spectrum, across despite the divide, Libyan Parliament, which ba backs one set of government in South. And the uh, uh, high uh, political council uh, or interim uh, presidential council in Tripoli, both of them uh, condemned uh, the uh, the meeting and demanded a strong action against uh, uh, the foreign minister. Of course, that was then when it was not clear whether foreign minister was solely responsible for it. Now it is clear that the Beba is also part of it. So there were also calls of the Beba's resignation. So uh, you can see that there is a a, a country which is divided uh, politically, there is divided uh, politically, there is a war going on, and there is that to Palestinian issue. When it comes to Israel, there is almost a consensus, both among the people and among the political elite. Despite the the, the U.S. attempts to basically take away some of the uh, uh, political elite in the country, including uh, 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 Prime Minister Dababa and other political leaders, some of them, who have been uh, found uh, party of this particular plan to normalize relations, a large, large uh, the majority of the Libyans rejected, and that was shown in the demonstration which ha happened, and that is also reflected in the uh, the pressure which the Beba government felt in uh, completely denying washing their hands with uh, uh, what happened uh, between Libya's foreign minister and uh, Israeli foreign minister. Right, Abdul, thank you for joining us. Ultra-processed foods are already linked to a large number of health problems. Two new studies talk about how ultra-processed foods raise the risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, heart attacks and strokes. Experts say these findings should serve as a wake-up call for governments everywhere. However, as fresh food becomes increasingly unaffordable, ultra-processed food comes in as a quick, cheap and convenient option for a large population, especially people who are younger, poorer, or from disadvantaged areas. We go to Anna for more on this issue. Hi, Anna. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, instinctively, a lot of us know that ultra-processed food is bad for our health. What are the new and surprising aspects of these studies? Well, uh, you know, um, moving away a bit from uh, the new data, that's, uh, I just want to start that, you know, uh, the new studies that have been discussed in the media recently, uh, actually add to the body of evidence that we already had from before uh, that show uh, that somehow ultra-processed foods impact human health. So, uh, you know, it's not something uh, it's not something breaking because it's uh, a possible effect that uh, many researchers have warned against for years now. Uh, but it's good to see that you know uh, this kind of evidence is mounting up. It's coming from different uh, from different perspectives, and it's actually pointing us into the direction that um, 
that the researchers who came up with this uh, classification of food uh, were actually warning against from the beginning. And so just, you know, to break it up, maybe just very shortly, what we're talking about here uh, it's, uh, is the NOVA classification of food that originates from a group of researchers from the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and essentially what they were trying to say from, uh, from the very beginning that, uh, you know, we should um, look at food in uh, through these categories, starting from food which is minimally processed, which is essentially non-processed at all, so the food that we find, find around us, uh, mounting up to the fourth category, which is ultra-processed food, which uh, I think now it's already fair to say that it's uh, very difficult to call it food because it's a substance that's been bro broken up so many times and configured so many times, rearranged industrially through different processes uh, so many times that it's essentially edible substance. Uh, what uh, you know, and this this kind of edible substance, they they've said that uh, it's very likely because of how it's arranged and how it's processed. Uh, it's um, it's very likely to to impact human health on different uh, on different scales. Uh, and, you know, uh, so the latest studies that uh, we're talking about here, of course, uh, talk about cardiovascular health. Uh, but I think it's also important to mention that over the past couple of years, uh, we have seen uh, also evidence coming in that it could uh, impact uh, the rates of dementia that we're seeing. Uh, it's definitely impacting uh, the rates of diabetes that we're seeing in the world. Uh, so it's um, it's something that's uh, quite quite a serious public health concern, but one that's being countered by the industry a, a lot. Right, of course, the ultra processed food industry is a huge one. And for many, ultra processed food is a much cheaper alternative. So, you know, do you think these studies are going to have an impact on how we consume our food and the policies governing our food? Well, I think it's fair to say that in combination uh, with a lot of mobilization and a lot of push by both public health experts, but, by also, but also activists on the ground, uh, it can lead to improvements. So, for example, uh, to come back to the example of Brazil, uh, we have seen uh, a couple of policies lately, uh, the most recent one in Rio de Janeiro, but one, a similar one uh, also being uh, supported uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, that essentially bans uh, the selling and the advertising of ultra processed foods among uh, in schools so you know among children who are who have been proven to be especially vulnerable to the uh, to the tactics of the ultra processed foods industries so what we can see is an improvement uh, in health policies uh, if there's the political will uh, and you know the backing to actually implement that but unfortunately what we're seeing in other parts of the world that it's not really that easy so you know um, I think, and we have spoken about this also, also in debrief before, um, in some parts of Europe, especially in the United Kingdom, ultra processed foods now make most of daily diets uh, of all people, not only of children. Uh, and this is very likely uh, to have uh, long lasting effects uh, on their health. Uh, but the, the policies that uh, are being taken by the government uh, are essentially not enough to tackle this problem. And that's because it's very reluctant to break with the industry to actually uh, uh, criticize it openly and uh, to take seriously that, uh, you know, the way they market, the way that uh, they talk about the ultra processed foods, uh, like being very natural or being low in sugar, low in salt, low in fat, which should all be associated with good health, is ess uh, essentially misleading. Uh, and it's causing, uh, it's causing very, very damaging effects for, for people. Right, Anna, thanks for this update. And this is all we have in this episode of The Daily Debrief. For more details on these stories and for other such stories, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For more video updates, visit our YouTube page. Thank you for watching.